Kia ora and welcome to this Manaki Whenua Link Online webinar for October. I'm Christine Harper, Manaki Whenua's Stakeholder Relationship Manager, and my job is helping to join the dots between our research and the questions that you, our stakeholders, are grappling with. Today we'll take you to exotic locations to look at a, a project that spans a number of conservation challenges and share some thinking about how we can apply those lessons to New Zealand. Araceli is a conservation biologist with 20 years of experience. She has led and contributed to numerous island rodent eradications all around the globe, providing practical guidance while also undertaking applied research. I'll be back at the end to help with your questions. Don't forget to put them in the chat box as soon as you can. But now let's just head off into the South Atlantic. Over to you, Araceli. Thank you. Kia ora, Christine. Morena, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. And it's always really exciting to talk about GOF. So the Gulf Island Restoration Program is a joint initiative between the RSPB, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, and Tristan da Cunha, with the support of any other organizations. Uh, Manaki Fenua is one of the partners, and I joined the implementation team as the technical advisor. So Gulf Island is located right between South Africa and Argentina. Um, here there is the UK overseas territory of Tristan da Cunha, which is an archipelago, and Gulf is part of this archipelago. The island is home to 22 species of seabirds and two species of land birds, several of which are endemic to the island and to, or to the archipelago, and sadly, um, quite a few of them are also endangered. One of the main threats are invasive species on the islands where these seabirds breed. And on Gulf, mice are the only invasive mammals and they cause well over, um, they cause the loss of well over 2 million um, eggs and chicks every year. Mice attack small species like prions and petrels to the point that 0% success breeding is common in some species but they also attack larger birds, even albatrosses, as you can see here, and that includes chicks and adults. This, this video was kindly provided by RSPB, and as you can see, there are at least two mice on the back of this female, Tristan, Tristan albatross, She's not happy. She's really stressed, um, but she doesn't really know what to do. They didn't evolve with predators, so it's really hard for them to react properly. And sadly, a lot of them die, both the adults and the chicks. So acknowledging this, RSPB launched the uh, island, the Gulf Restoration Program. Acknowledging since the very beginning that this was a really challenging undertaking. This was a significant step up in terms of uh, mouse eradications. And because of the uh, size and the, uh, the terrain and the logistics, and it was just a really complex project. So there is no surprise that, sorry, I'm having a problem with the, Next one is not coming out. Trying to get the nicest slide. Okay. So it's not a surprise that the, um, the project took a while um, to get organized. So from identifying the project, the problem, um, assessing feasibility, and then getting ready to the point of having a, um, a team ready to implement the eradication attempt. This is Gough from above, and as I was saying, it's quite rugged, especially in the north and in the east, um, really high cliffs all around. This square is, is the 
area where human infra infrastructure, the limited infrastructure is located. So there is a, a meteorological base that was also used as uh, the base of operations for, for the eradication. So we had actually several projects running at the same time. So agriculture required quite a bit of new infrastructure. So all this was built um, for the eradication and it was about holding or caring for the birds. So aerial baiting also required quite a bit of infrastructure, uh, especially around working with uh, several helicopters in all this area for the bait. Ground baiting was initially planned uh, to be done only inside and under the buildings, so maximizing aerial baiting. Um, but shortly before implementation, um, it was decided that roughly this area in yellow should be done by helicopter, rather, um, sorry, by hand rather by helicopter. And we did it uh, efficiently, but I want to stress that it was uh, an extra work um, for an already busy team. And monitoring um, has been ongoing for several years. There has been a lot of research and trials around the birds and around the mice, and this work is um, still ongoing. Don't have much time to talk about aviculture, so, but I, it's important that you know that this implied having in captivity two species. Uh, one is the gulf bunting and the other one was the gulf moorhen. Aerial baiting required four helicopters and um, two baiting teams. So all the, um, all the loading of the buckets was done by hand and this is um, a lot of labor. Regarding mouse activity, this is how mouse activity looked like just before we started baiting. And keep in mind, this is winter. This is the low uh, peak for the population. But you get the idea. We had a lot of mice. So now I'm going to give you a quick summary of the, um, how the operation progress over time. So we got to the island early June, and then by mid-June we had, we were ready uh, for baiting, and that's what I'll call day one. So the day we started putting bait on the ground. We started with the aerial operation, and then that same day we did all the hand baiting, this area around the buildings. Um, and then around monitoring, I mean uh, direct observations, they work with cameras and they work with traps. Now, a not important note is that we, trapping is not a, sorry, having trouble with the next slide. Trapping is not an eradication method. Uh, we did it just to ease the pressure on the, on the pens. Uh, mice were trying to get to the birds. So um, we did some trapping for that and then we use it as a monitoring tool, but uh, not, an, as, not as an eradication method. So this is what happened on day one. We covered quite a bit of ground because we had good weather and all this was done. So um, a big chunk of area around the base was covered that, uh, that first day. And as I said, we did the, the baiting around base as well. This is the area that we covered by hand and to do this properly, you need to set up a, a grid of markers on the ground. So in this case, we had a 10 by 10 meter grid. And um, with a team of people, we did this very carefully so that ensuring there was no bait gaps on the ground. This stars show uh, the location of the cameras that we had around this uh, area, uh, 10 cameras. And the overwintering team had been doing this work systematically actually for the previous month, months. So by the time we started baiting, we already had a really good idea of what uh, a standard mouse activity uh, looked like. So it was good to have a baseline. 
So about, about seven to 10 days later, we were still working on the first drop uh, because of bad weather, mainly. Some days we just couldn't do any baiting at all. By then, um, we were having no take from, um, from around the buildings. I think I didn't mention that uh, for baiting the buildings, we use open Petri dishes, so the mice could have easy access to the bait. So by putting Petri dishes inside and under the buildings, we were also able to monitor bait take. But then by this time, um, we could not see any mouse just walking around. Uh, there was nothing in the cameras and nothing in the traps. By day 11, uh, we had completed the first drop. Uh, we had no news around the buildings and we went and take a look at the bait on the mountaintops. We were a bit worried that uh, because of the terrain and the intense rain that we were having those, those weeks, um, uh, we were worried that the bait could be like just, you know, washing down the slope, but it wasn't the case. So it was really reassuring to see that there was a lot of bait um, on the tops in, in really good condition, actually, uh, after a couple of weeks after the, after the drop. So that was really good news. And then we moved on about 10 days later, we were ongoing with the second drop. Um, no news around the buildings, um, no sign of mice. We moved the cameras, I'll show you where. Uh, and then we got some bad news. Um, we went and take a look at the bait in the lowlands and we couldn't find any bait. So around the cameras, you could see, um, as you saw in the, in the video that, we had a, a peak of activity right before baiting, but then this collapsed really quickly and then stayed um, zero for quite a few days. So after 17 days, uh, we decided to move the cameras that were around the base and we put them farther away, um, farther away from base in all directions. And then we did that about every week. We moved it, we moved them farther and farther away. And this, a blue purple area it's where we did uh, the other bait, bait search so this area was covered by the helicopter and as you can see the vegetation is quite different from the tops so here we have more diversity taller vegetation uh, it gets quite dense we even have trees uh, in the lowlands short trees but still it gets tricky to to go to go around um, then we had a good team uh, with the only mission that day to find bait to see the condition and we couldn't find not a single tiny fragment of bait. So that was not good news. That was completely unexpected um, and a total surprise because even with that amount of mice, um, we shouldn't have been seeing that. So by day 30, we were still ongoing with the second drop, um, nothing in the buildings. We right after the second drop, uh, we set up some um, bait plots, both in the lowlands and the highlands, to monitor um, how long bait was lasting under these different conditions. We found two mice on the cameras, and then is when we realized that we had problems with slugs. So here. Um, you can see these cameras have been working for weeks and detecting no mice shortly after the first drop. But then about four days before the, the, second, the second drop, um, we started seeing up to two mice um, for, uh, for four consecutive days. The good news is that they were really interested in our detection devices, so they were chewing on everything. And as you can see, they were particularly interested in this little cage, which contains bait. So two pieces of bait are inside there, but they don't have access to it. They just can't smell it. And they were really trying hard to, uh, to get to it. So this went on for four days. And the day that we put bait on the ground in that area uh, for the second time, these mice disappeared. And this was actually the last time we saw um, any sign of mice on the island during the time that we were there. So as I said, uh, we started taking a closer look uh, at the bait after the second drop, and we saw things like this. 
this looks a bit scary, but actually um, it's not really a problem because millipedes are really slow at eating. So in practical terms, this was not really an issue. The bait was lasting uh, under these conditions. Uh, on the other hand, we saw that most pellets were kind of in a weird shape, deformed, and then we realized that slugs were the cause of this. So 50 days later, we were just finishing the second drop and then we went on to the third drop, which was always meant to be a partial one. So two applications over the whole of the island and the third one was going to be targeting high risk spots. And this was adjusted and I'll show you um, in, in, in a map. Uh, nothing around the buildings, no news. And, and during all these weeks in between, we had no mice uh, in the traps or in the cameras uh, and, and nowhere to be seen. I'll show you the results from the bait plots and a little bit more about the slugs. So we confirmed that bait on the mountain tops where the vegetation is really low and, and you, it's hard to see any slugs, the bait lasts for a long time there. This is this is days. Whereas the same plots anywhere in the lowlands where we have this dense vegetation and a lot of uh, invertebrates, mainly slugs, um, the bait disappears really quickly. And this is how quickly. So this is after the third drops. Mice were undetectable by then and the bait just went super quickly because of the slugs. We did a series of experiments in the lab, and this is just to show you that we managed to replicate this, this weird shape that we were seeing in the pellets um, on the ground outside. Uh, we managed to replicate that in the lab just by offering pellets to slugs. So the third drop uh, was meant to be mainly around the mountain tops uh, because of the rugged terrain. But that was adjusted and the focus shift towards the lowland area. So all these areas with the taller vegetation um, were targeted for, for this drop. And this is the result of that work. Now, I know you want to hear a lot more details. Some of you uh, would be interested in more details. So you can take a look at, at the papers that, that are coming out. This one um, has described in detail all the work around the slugs and the bait plots. This one focuses on the camera work. And this one focuses on the bait, uh, the bait, the ground baiting around the buildings. There are other pieces coming out as well. Pete is busy working on the, uh, the main overall paper describing the whole of the, the, whole of the operation. And by Pete, I mean Pete McClellan, who was the operations manager, um, which means the boss on the island. So we were optimistic by the time we left Gough in August. So it was crushing to hear in December that a mouse uh, was caught in camera. So these cameras were set up to monitor the, the birds that were being finally released uh, after months in captivity. So this was crushing. Uh, one mouse uh, by January became a few mice, um, but in more than one place. So it was clear that the eradication had failed. And of course, then and now uh, we are wondering, well, why, why did it fail? Um, and it's, <laughs> I'm not going into the conclusion on why it failed because a formal review of the operation is ongoing. So. This is this. This will be a, a very, a very thorough process of looking at every potential cause of, of eradication, and coming to a conclusion. So I want to be respectful of that um, process, but I want to share with you some comments um, on the learnings based on the my personal uh, observation being on the island, the research that we did uh, while while on the island. And also the work that the over overwintering team did after uh, they found some mice. So they did a lot of detection work over a few months. But in summary, it seems that 
very few mice survived somewhere in the lowlands. And then eventually, uh, once the spring came, they started breeding and spreading everywhere and eventually reached base again as well. So to the learnings, first of all, um, I really think it can be done. We came really close to succeeding. We did have issues with beta availability, and that's the main thing that we need to look uh, while preparing for, our next, for the next attempt. The bait that we used, best of, performed really well. So no issues here, I would use it again. The highland and the lowland areas need to be considered separately. As you saw, there is contrasting um, conditions in terms of vegetation, but also weather and target and non-targeted species. So this needs to be dissected uh, more, I believe. Slugs were definitely the, the big news, uh, the bad news. I believe this problem could have been identified during the trials, but it wasn't with significant implications. So we still know very little about them. We know there are at least three species on Gov. Um, they are all invasive. Um, well, three species, three invasive species. Um, um, and there is a other a native and we don't really know much about them, where they are and what they are capable uh, of. And that's why having relevant experts on the ground is its key. Um, we identified this problem um, this time with the slugs, last time in the tropics was the, was the land crabs, and then next time in one of these large projects in New Zealand could be something else that we haven't thought about. So it's really important to make use of the experts. Baiting of base is straightforward, but needs a lot of attention to detail. So it needs to be done really, really carefully, but should not be an issue. Aviculture is doable as well, um, but it might be better done off island um, because it did create a lot of extra work and um, stress uh, in some things needed to be done in a more complex way because all of this. And also maybe only more hints need to be into captivity, not the bantings. Project continuity can be improved. It, it is tricky when you have these really long projects that go on for 10, 20 years, but we need to acknowledge that a lot is lost every time that there are changes in the team. And I'm talking about both the on and off island teams. And last but not least, it is worth trying again. Uh, after all, it was a really good breeding season just, just with a few mice, just with a few months without mice. So of course it is tempting to say, well, we just, I need just a little bit more bait, but we need to be mindful that it was already a complex and expensive project and it already required the largest ship that you can get. So adding anything to what we already did would have flow on effects uh, on many other different components. Logistics are really complex. So that is something that large projects should be always mindful of. But again, we should try, we should try again. Uh, we have more than 2 million reasons for it. And yes, mice are increasing quite quickly, actually. But on, in the words of Andrew Callender, who is the program executive, doing nothing is still not an option. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll leave you with a gathering of prions. Kiana, thanks very much, Araceli. That was absolutely fantastic. We've got some great questions coming through as well, and I just, uh, you know, spoiler alert, we're not going to get through them all, but we will respond to all of your questions um, in writing. Uh, to everybody that has, has asked us a question because there's some really good ones there. Um, I'm just going to chip in with one question because we've got three minutes left, and that is, apart from the size, what's the difference between mice and rats when it comes to eradication? <laughs> Thanks. Um, really good question. It depends a lot on the method that you're using, and for these large-scale projects, uh, has to be done by helicopter anyway. So 
done by helicopter there is there is not much difference uh, it's, it's the same method the same bed bait and um, very similar bait rates actually so it's about having a really good distribution and it's only when it comes to uh, baiting uh, around urban environments that it, the, the difference can be larger because mice tend to be a bit more like inside inside houses and so that might require uh, extra extra effort uh, but we are actually looking at this properly the, the overall message is that they can be done at the same time actually the the records um, for rats and mice are multi-species projects so targeting mice and rats at the same time uh, and we actually have a paper on that and a talk that we are going to give in the next uh, new zealand ecological society conference and um, looking at the issue of mice and why they should be done at the same time with rats because we can do it at the same time great and we've got uh, time for one more um and i was curious about this how did mice originally get to gough island and how long have they been there oh they they've done they've been there for uh, at least 100 years and uh, most likely with ships um, maybe shipwrecks as with as is the case on <laughs> for many islands um, so it was just by accident which is most most of the time the case right okay and i think we might squeeze in one more one quick <laughs> one what uh you mentioned pissed off what is the toxin being used oh it is prodificum uh, 20 parts per million Lovely. Great. Well, on that, I, we will wrap this uh, webinar up. Um, rest assured, you will be able to review this again through the link that you receive in, in your email in the next hour or so. And we will also load it up to our website so that you can easily share it uh, with other people. All those who've asked all these uh, really interesting but sometimes quite long questions, uh, we will come back to you with uh, some res considered responses on those and share them as well. We'll be back with another webinar in November and uh, look forward to welcoming you all along again. So thank you very much, Araceli, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Bye thank for now. Very much.